welcome to Bible study. I want to welcome to those of you that are joining us here. For those of you that are joining us online, we've kind of been skipping our invocation and, and our praise and worship set, leaning more towards your experience at home. Nobody's there to invoke God. Is that right? And nobody's there to lead you in a worship song. Amen. So just for a moment, pray to him as if you were at home. Hallelujah. Invite him. It doesn't have to be loud. It doesn't have to be wordy. It just has to be sincere. It has to be a prayer that you believe that if you seek the Lord and ask him, he will. Hallelujah. He will. Answer your prayer. Teach you his word. Hallelujah. And you can ask in faith because he promised that he would. He promised that the Holy Spirit would lead and guide the church into all truth. And so all you have to do is believe that he'll do what he said. You ask him, hallelujah, that I stand before you with no goodness of my own. I stand before you with the goodness of your own word, your own promise. Hallelujah. And I can count on you, Father, to do what you said to lead and guide us into all truth. You promised that when we received your spirit, we would be able to bear your word. Hallelujah. We're depending on you for that. So can you give grace to the minister and grace to the hearer? Let us, Father, walk away from this study, not just retaining what you taught, but retaining how to navigate your word. Hallelujah. We give you glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So I, that's what I do. I spend time in the presence of God. That's how I study the word. I spend time in the presence of the Lord. And, glory to God, I allow him to direct me. I, I, I study out of fellowship. And I want you guys to know that I don't just, when I'm writing a study guide, because that's what most people are trying to understand. How do you navigate these scriptures in the study guide? That doesn't happen. That, that comes on the back end of a fellowship. Amen? But I'm just like you. I've read my word or read something someone else wrote and needed more understanding. More understanding. And there are things that the Lord has taught me over the years that has changed how I navigate the word. It's given me clarity. Took veil off the scripture. Hallelujah. But I will tell you this. Nothing replaces fellowship. Amen? So today, I am not going to start off teaching anything, amen, because I know the moment I open something up, it normally takes the class, right, amen. So I'm going to do my best to let you guide us today, amen. I am hoping, not demanding, hoping, what am I not doing, but what am I, what am I doing? I'm hoping that you'll be able to take us to a place in the study guide that spawns your question. And then from there, or whatever scripture is attached to that area, we start looking at how, where would I go in scripture to begin to dig or to answer scriptural questions, et cetera, et cetera. Amen? All right. So the floor is open for those of you that are joining us here, those of you joining us online. Go ahead and click like, click share. Invite some other people into this question-based Bible study. And, glory to God, let us know where you're joining us from. I want to welcome Nicole, who is joining us from Orlando. Winston from Orlando. Um, Sean Hopkins joining us from Pompano. Um, Prophetess Michelle Brassad joining us from Atlanta. Shar joining us from Decatur, Georgia. Amen. And all of you that are joining us right here from Acts Auditorium on the Orlando campus. All right. Question. Come on. Because all y'all say y'all was going to be ready. Amen. And y'all could have asked from your seat if you wanted to. You're more than welcome. Leon's right there waiting to serve you. Amen. There you go. We're making it easy for you. Amen. Let us serve you. 
All right, so um, where my study is is right now is the first phase of the manifestation of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And my question is based on the time of events, right? Okay. During the time of the kingdom ruling inside of us. Uh -huh. So the first thing I had was the treaty that Israel makes with the Antichrist. Okay. Now, here, okay, I'm going to answer your question. You done deviated from, my, from what I wanted. Okay. Okay, and it's okay. It's okay. Don't mm -hmm. feel bad about it. Amen. But it's, that ain't based on the study. Okay, so this is where it led me in the study. Okay. Based on our Thank conversation, um, well, the discipleship that we had on Sunday. So okay. I had. I uh, can gather that. Okay. Come on. So give me your question. I'll answer your question because I don't want y'all to feel boxed in. Okay. You understand me? But I want you guys to know that if we don't stay squared in somewhat, we're going to get sporadic. You understand me? And I'm trying to accomplish two birds in one stone. The study guide that we've studied on, I want y'all, you understand? Mm -hmm. The study guide that we've studied on as well as how to navigate scripture. Y'all understand what I'm showing you? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I don't want, because all of y'all are out here in th places I haven't gone yet. And sometimes when I write, I, the, what will help you comprehend that is comprehending what was wrote. You guys will jump past comprehending what was written to you, to some way out here. And a, the way I write is foundational. I build like, just like a house. And I'm doing it to you the way God did it with me. You understand? So I'm okay with the question, but you got to show me how you got to the question. How did, how did we go from our study to this question? And then... Because you're asking me how, when, that's where y'all started off at. Y'all started off asking me, how do you study the study guide? <laughs> right? <laughs> do you see? And I wanted to show you how I would navigate it. But I, I'm open to answer any questions. I don't want y'all to, but I want you to work with me so we can see the complication that way out yonder causes, right? Okay. Now, what is your question about the particular question you have about the peace treaty? Um, well, <laughs> can we it's go to okay. somebody else and, and let them start off in the study guide and then I'll come back? No, it's okay. Cause if where you're going to be at is still, it's okay. Well, let me tell you how I got there. Okay. So basically, um, understanding what's going on now while the kingdom is in that first phase of manifestation uh -huh. as it pertains to, um, as it pertains to like, um, the timeline events so i kind of was studying the first phase and what's going to happen before the return of the lord because i haven't gotten to the second um manifestation of the kingdom which is the millennial reign that part mm -hmm. so i'm kind of like right in that part so okay. that's how i got to it as far as like what's what's the first phase and what's going to happen before we get to the next phase okay so that's, that's, that's where, it, how I got there. Okay. What is it that you're trying to know, which is, I still don't understand. Okay. So the question was from Daniel 9 and 27. Okay. And that speaks to the, um, the peace treaty. Okay. And so my question was, um, after I read 27, I wanted to know, um, when it says, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know if I had the breakdown of this scripture correct as far as one year equaling one day and the week seven days just to know what's that middle period before the tribulation starts. Okay. Ask me that question one more time. I, I understand you're trying to make sure that your comprehension is correct mm -hmm. in saying that this week represents seven years. Right. A year a day. A year a day. That's true. Okay. Okay. And now, then the second part was, 
so then the midst of the week, that's half of the seven years. Is that what that verse is saying in verse 27? When it's, let's read 27. Okay. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he will make it desolate, even until the consumption and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now, from this particular chapter, for this particular verse, the only thing that's being said here is that the covenant is going to be seven years. That is a week of years, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the years represent a day. The, I mean, each um, day represent a year. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's a seven year peace treaty somewhere in the middle around three and a half years. That peace treaty is going to be brought to an end. Now, it this would take a whole day of study, but not a, a class. If I really took you through the scriptures to show it to you, because there's so much on this particular subject. Um, and what let me give you just some points. So make sure you keep your pen or typing along the way so you can study these things. Do you remember that Jesus, um, there's a passage of scripture, um, okay, let's see if I can find it for you so I can at least show it to you. Let's see if I can find it. Let's see. Okay, hold on. The reason why I did not do this on screen, because you don't need, I didn't tell you what I was searching for. Okay? But I'll, I'll share it with you and show you how to find it. Okay? All right. Go to Isaiah 28 and 14. Well, I guess we'll start at 13, and I'll connect some dots here, and I'll tell you how I found it, amen? Because I would have had to do too much explaining, and I don't want to, you're going to see in a minute while I'll get down in nooks and crannies, because I'm, what I'm getting ready to throw at you is nowhere in our study guide, it's nowhere in what we've, we've, we're talking about as of yet, but it's pertinent to the question. You, you understand? Okay. So it says here what? But the word of the Lord was unto them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. All right. Now, how many people know what this applies to? There's something I literally taught in conference that this, that this should be pertinent standing out in your imagination. Do you remember what that was? No, ma'am. Remember I did a whole day session on something called the elect? Hello? And I studied a scripture that is popularly believed, even among people that know truth, that when Jesus said, it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom. Do you remember that? And it was said and is said and believed in some groups that that meant because you are apostles, it's given to you. But it is not given to the rest of the people because they are to get it through the apostle. Correct? But we studied that out, that that's not what that scripture means. Yes, no. That scripture meant they were not elected to know that Jesus or God has determined in each generation the remnant of people in Israel who were qualified to know the truth. And, and, and what did we learn in Romans? That the remnant received understanding, but the rest of the nation was left blind. Is that what we studied? Did we learn that? Okay, so here now, 
Remember I told y'all, I, I said to you guys when I was teaching, I didn't go to this passage, but I told you it was here. I told you this passage was here. I said it's also mentioned over there in Isaiah 28 where you get the scripture about doctrine and about how in the days of Jesus, how in the days of Jesus all the tables would be unclean. No one would have a pure word when Jesus came forth. You seeing it? So here you are. This is now you're over here. Hello? We learning? Okay. So the ninth verse is what we're used to reading. Go up to the ninth verse, Danielle, so the people can see it. This is the one we're used to reading. Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Who oh, is he going to teach knowledge? Who is going to make to understand doctrine? Come on. Them that are weaned from the milk. Come on. And drawn from the breasts. Remember, I explained this part about their, what, what does the baby do that's on the breast? They're not eating directly. The, it's being funneled through a mature one to them. And this is how people get lost because you solely rely on what a leader told you the word meant versus learning how do I determine, which is what you're trying to do tonight, right? Okay, so remember, so he goes on in the 10th verse, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and... There a little. Right? Okay, so when we go down to 13, look at what it is saying and put it in context. What is he saying? But the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept. Uh-huh. Precept upon precept. Come on. Line upon line. Yes. Line upon line. Uh-huh. Here a little and there a little. Okay. Are y'all seeing this? Come on. That they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. Jesus is teaching them. He's using parables, but all the parables match him with the scripture. Everything he's teaching is findable in the book, and the people wouldn't hear him. God said, let them, let them, let their eyes be dull, let their ears be heavy, hearing they'll hear not, seeing that. You remember all those scriptures? Okay, so let's put it in line, okay? Now, look at 14. He says what? Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men that rule this people which is in Jerusalem. Uh-oh, so he's getting specific now. He's not talking about some random nation. He's talking to the rulers of the people in Jerusalem. What does he say? Because ye have said, we have made a covenant with death, and with hell are we at agreement. Now stop right there. That's key. That's key. That's key to the question that Evangelist Von asked us. Let's talk about this peace treaty. Hello? Are y'all working with me? Look at what he says. He says, you've made a covenant with death. Jesus says, I came in my father's name and you wouldn't receive me, but there's one that will come in his own name. You'll receive him, no. The nation that I form rejected me but you will embrace the one that comes in his own name the one that will receive honor of men he's talking about the antichrist remember i told you that well israel is going to enter a covenant with them also popularly known as the peace treaty he says you you made a covenant with death and with hell so that's what your agreement is with. Look at this. When the what? Overflowing scourge shall pass through. Come on. It shall not come unto us. Come on. For we have made lies our refuge. Okay, so when the Antichrist is wrecking the world, their belief will be it's not going to happen to us. Now, do you remember me teaching you that when the armies encompass Jerusalem, they're not going to even be alarmed if they're not looking through the eyes of the prophecy. Come on, somebody. They're going to be in the dark. Hello? They're going to be like the foolish virgins with no lamp. 
They don't see what's happening. The setup is going on. How many people seeing it? Amen. So now look at what he says. He says, so he says, we have made lies our refuge. Come on. And under falsehood have we hid ourselves. Now watch this. Come on. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God. Come on. Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone. Come on. I gave you the truth and who the truth was and who I would build everything on. I put something in Zion for a foundation to everything I'll do. And it's a stone. Come on, read. A tried stone. Yes. A precious cornerstone. Come on. A sure foundation. Come on. He that believeth shall not make haste. Come on. Judgment also will I lay to the line. Uh -huh. And righteousness to the plummet. Mm -hmm. And the hell shall sweep away the refuge of lies. Mm -hmm. And the waters shall overflow the hiding place. Mm -hmm. And your covenant with death shall be disannulled. And your what? Covenant with death shall be disannulled. He, uh, I'm going to disannul your covenant. You're going to make a covenant with death, but I'm going to cause it to be disannulled. I'm going to break the covenant. I'm going to break it up. I'm going to disannul. You're going to make the covenant, but I'm going to destroy it. How is he going to do that? Do you know? I'm going to cause the Antichrist to break his end. Hello? I'm going to cause the Antichrist to break his in. He going he gonna to tell you he going to be at peace with you. He's going to tell you he respects your, the, your fact to worship what you choose to. The God of heaven. Come on, somebody. He's going to tell you you can build your temple and offer up your sacrifices. But at some point, in the middle of it, hello? Hello? He's going to go into the temple and set himself up and say, I'm your God. And that will be the abomination of desolation because the nation will not go. The corrupt leaders are going to be willing to go, but the nation going to say, oh, no, we only serve one God now. <laughs> Israel have done a lot of things now. But they have not gone thus far to verbally denounce the one God. So that's going to create a divide where there was once unity. Hello? And when the Antichrist can't get what he wants, what is he going to do? Huh? He going to turn to kill them. So when you see the armies encompass Jerusalem, don't go back in your house. To even pack clothes, run. If you're in an adjacent city, one pastor says, don't go visit. Because everything in the city going to get killed or taken to prison. And the city will be desolate. The abomination of desolation means the abomination committed by Israel's leadership. And in conjunction with the Antichrist, that allows God to pull back Michael and all of the guards that once protected Israel and let the enemy have full course to what's in the city. And that's called the desolation. If I took you into, and there's so much on it, that's the reason why I'm teetering as much as, and, 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 and maybe... Um, I'll give you some things more private, Vonnie, because I'm teetering, because if I, that's, a, that's a whole door. If you start talking to me about the peace treaty, you're talking about a seven-year agreement, and then what is it going to take to break that up? Do you understand? And in Revelations, it's called the fall of Babylon. Did you know that? Look up Babylon falling. Keyword search it.
You see it? Where did it say? Where did you find it in Revelations? You're looking for it in Revelations. Okay. Now, what did you look at it at? Let me see what you looked at first. Revelations 14 and, okay, did you read it and put it in context? Okay, read right there at 8. What does it say? And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Okay, where else did you see it? Revelations 18 and verse 2. Okay, what does it say? And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Uh -huh. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, uh -huh. and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Give me one moment. Okay. Now, when you're reading, you guys went to 18 and 2, right? Is that what y'all sent? Okay, when you went to 18 and 2, 18 and 2 is the offspring of the whole 17th chapter. You ready? Okay, look at 17 and 1. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vows, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, mm -hmm. with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the, the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Okay, now, now we got to consider something here now. 
Okay? Let's, let's look at something here. He says, now the kings of the earth have committed fornication with this woman. Remember now, when you're looking at symbols in scripture, those of you guys that took rightly dividing the word. Hello? What do you have to do? What's the first thing you do when you see a prophetic symbol in scripture? How many people remember? Because this is going to help also with the question Vani asked. The first thing you do anytime you go to any scripture, what do you do? You gain context. Context is going to provide a safe boundary to make sure you don't violate the scriptures with what you think of them. It anchors the scripture to make sure you are not tossed in your perception. You ready? Then you would find out, okay, if a symbol is used, the first place you look is, is the context going to tell you what symbol it is, like it does here for some of the symbols that are used here. This is laced with prophetic symbols. And this is one of the reasons why I was saying to you guys, when I was saying, when I said to Bunny, like this is a big one. That's a good question, but it's a big question. And the reason why it's a big question is why it's probably, why she probably got stuck searching it. Because it's been taught peace treaty. That's what it's been taught. And that's what you'll call it. But it's hard to find it in scripture. If you don't know what you're looking for. Because in scripture, it's covenant of death. It's promised peace, but there will be none. It's, do you see? It's things like that. And if you don't know those other catchphrases about that particular subject matter, it's easy to miss it. So where a person would have to begin, if they started where Vani was in, in Daniel, the first thing you're going to have to do is now begin to search for covenant, right? What did it say there? Daniel 27, 9 and 27, what did it say? And he shall confirm the covenant with, with many for one week. So that's what you would look for, covenant, You would start looking for a covenant that would last a week, a covenant that would last seven years, or a covenant that would last the amount of days that the three years would equal. Trick there, though. The Jewish calendar is different from the Western calendar you would count. And they have a different amount of days in them. So then, but if, so if you don't take into account the other things that you learned in rightly dividing the word, which is who was writing? Who was being wrote to? Do you remember? What dispensation of time were they being wrote in? All of those things color in the missing parts of scripture. It allows you to investigate the scripture more proficiently. You had a question. It was, it was based on what you just said. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so the, uh, the week, it was in the midst of the week and you were saying look for months and things like that. Um, would Revela Revelation 13 and 5 be accurate for that, for what you just said? Revelations, wh what are you asking me? I don't know what, when so you say when you were talking about things like that. Okay. You okay. You said, so if we were searching from Daniel 9 and 27, uh -huh. you said, don't just look for week. You would look for how many years might it equal or how many days or how many months. So I did that. You wouldn't look for it. Okay. You can't, this is the part that makes that one question so tricky. Okay. And that's the reason why I'm saying to you guys, okay, when you guys are reading See, there's a, there's a difference between, and I want y'all to, to, to hear me because I think sometimes y'all are missing the cue here. There is a difference between you searching for what you already know with what I wrote and, and what I wrote and that sent you into a study. You see, 
you're not, when you got already got knowledge, your study is not organic. Your study is not taking the trail that truth would lead you down. What you're doing is saying, okay, but I heard about this over here. Where that go? You see the difference? That's not a, that's not a study trail. That is a curiosity based on some you heard over here, some you already have knowledge of. The trail itself is not leading you into truth. Do you, you understand the difference? And that's and then what ends up happening is now you, instead of just following the breadcrumbs of scripture that'll just keep taking you into the deeper truth that God wants to take you, you're now playing the game that the children play with pegs. And now you're trying to find out, do the square peg you already know about fit here? You see the difference? And it makes you ask a question that is difficult to have come to from what you're telling me you read. Do you see? Because if you just read, if you didn't know anything, like if, with that question, if Bonnie didn't know anything about the peace treaty, if she had never heard of it before, never, and she just read Daniel, it would have created a different question. That question would have created a natural tidal wave. Do you understand? The, but the, what, the, what she read triggered some she already knew. That's not the natural progression of study. Am I making sense to you? Okay. So it's different between if you take somebody and you say, okay, one plus one is what? Okay, then you take them from that into what timetables are, and then from there into division, and then from division into fraction. It is a whole different thing if a person has already heard some theory of M equals square, and you're trying to take them into fractions. They're talking about, but what about M? You see the difference? It creates, a, it can be answered, but it's a whole nother dynamic. That, that is not a natural progression from what you're studying. Am I making sense to you? Okay, that's, and that's what I was trying to say. It, it, I don't want you guys not to have questions, and I don't want you to feel shameful in any type of way about the questions you have. I just need you to comprehend, okay, that's getting ready to, because to get from there way over to the peace treaty is so many other unlocks that have to happen. Am I making sense? And then that will create a whole nother study to be able to get us even from here to there. Because you got to understand, okay, what in this, what in Daniel 9 and 27 said peace treaty? What in it spawned that title? Do you see? Because if I'm rightly dividing the word, I'm not rightly dividing something in here. I'm rightly dividing what's in front of me on the page. I, I am breaking down what this said. Not my previous knowledge to how long, not my previous knowledge to what you call it. So in the question that was asked, even when Vaughn asked me and she said she spoke to the tribulation. See, that ain't no way in there. That's, that's prior knowledge. Do you see? So to answer that, it's a, it's a good question. It's pertinent to Bible prophecy because timeline is important. Comprehending the telltale signs of the approach of the abomination of desolation is going to save some lives or lose some. So it is not something that is wrong to want to know. It is not something that's wrong to be curious about. But when you're getting into rightly dividing the word, then that's a little different from what you're asking. You know what I mean? Like if I if you just if I was just coming to teach you stuff you wanted to know, that's one thing. But what you guys are trying to get is how do I navigate the scriptures to find that? Do you see what I'm saying? And remember, I told you the way I go is I allow the Lord to sit before me in most cases. What to study? I don't assume I know what I need to know. Am I making sense? So the the studies take a natural progression when I'm studying. Am I making sense? So 
When you start talking about, let me go back and show you something I was showing you in this passage, right? So when you get this, go to 17, um, Revelation 17, um, we were at the second verse. The kings have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and I saw the woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of what? Having what? Seven heads and ten horns. You ever heard that before? See, this is how you can start linking some of the beasts mentioned in Daniel because there are certain details about how many horns will be on the beast. It'll be certain different things. Those ne They'll start lining up. So how do I find myself to those things? Well, if, if something is mentioned over here, let's say a beast with ten horns, if I keyword search that everywhere that beast or ten horns is mentioned, if I keyword ten horns, everywhere that that is in scripture will come up. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Then I'm not, I'm not going to be, I'm still not trying to fit a peg, remember? I'm just gathering data. I'm gathering data. See, that makes the journey easier and less confusing. Because all I'm going to do is find out what did the ten horns, what was it talking about in this passage? What was the ten horns talk about in this passage? And then do they reconcile to come together to, and are they talking about the same thing? Do you see? Now, once that starts happening, natural information is going to be filling in along the way. And this is one of the reasons why I'm taking you this route and teaching you because most people who teach Bible prophecy is teaching you not from a discovery point of view. They are teaching you from a point of view of a person already knows. And then you're still not going to have what you're looking for, which is how do you know that and what made you look for that? And do you see how would I have navigated into that level of information on my own? That's what you want from me. You don't want to just know what all I know because I can dance you all through here. Do you see? But you want the, what is the route? You seeing it? Which means you got to give me something that creates a natural progression. Like I read this, what does this mean? Now, do you see? Now, it, just like that, if, like say for instance, that same question, if, 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 if Vonnie would have said to me, Okay, when I got to Daniel 9, I was reading, and then 27 said something I didn't understand. Break it down. Now you left me to rightly divide 9 and 27. That's not what you asked, though. What you asked me was specifically about something you already had knowledge of, and you asked me to reconcile the Scripture into your knowledge. See the difference? That's not natural progression. That's asking me to untangle your web. <laughs> you see the difference? Amen. Because I know y'all got a lot of stuff on these paper. So I'm giving you this in advance so you can find out what on that paper is the progression of a web. <laughs> Amen. Do you see? Two, it, you have three, I gave you three foundational things pertaining to the kingdom. Kingdom within. Natural question. What are the ear markers that we're here? Boom. What are the telltale signs? See, that's a natural question. That's what we're asked to Jesus. When will this be? And what is the sign of your appearing in the end of the world? Then, boom, question being answered. These are things you look for. You see, that's a natural progression. You see? Nothing wrong with the question, though. And I love the I Actually, I love the question. I love the question because it is a detail that a lot of people don't pay attention to, and you need to. Do you understand what I'm saying? But it, it is 
it is something that I would have to just teach a whole lesson on because it's not a, it's, that is not a scriptural based question, that's a knowledge based question. Am I making sense when I say that? Okay. Okay, let me show you this, I'm coming right to you. Look at what it says in the fifth verse. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Mm -hmm. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. So this woman now, whoever this woman is, has been responsible for blood of saints, blood shed of saints, the blood of martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration, who is this woman? So what does he say next? And the angel said unto me, wherefore didst thou marvel? Come on. I will tell thee the mystery of the woman. Come on. And of the beast that carrieth her. Come on. Which hath the seven heads and ten horns. So he telling you, I'll let you know who she is. I'll tell you what beast she owned. I'll tell you what all this means, which means now what do I do if I'm studying this? I keep reading to find out what is this angel talking to John going to say about these things. So I follow the trail. And I keep me, I write on my paper, Whore of Babylon. I write... I write whatever it called her, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, my Lord. I would write great beasts. I would write the detail. So therefore, and I would put that as a heading in different places on my paper. So now that everything that Talk about the beast that add to it. I'll bullet point what it says in the scripture that it's in. So that I can now start compiling my data. Now I'm talking about this when you investigate now. So you can compile your data. That's how you navigate through the scriptures. You seeing it now? Mm -hmm. So you start compiling your data. Now look at this. So he says, I'm going to tell you. Now look at 8 verse. What did he say? The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. Wait a minute. See? Details. That beast that you saw, hello, that was, then there comes a time that he is, and then shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. Mm -hmm. So all I got to do is now search who coming out of bottomless pit in scripture? Because if scripture got to answer that, that's going to be one. Hello? You cannot, all those other creatures that you saw coming out of the bottomless pit will disqualify. And I'm going to tell you why. Because they weren't before. This is something that was in the earth. Then was not in the earth because they got locked up for a thousand years. And then after the thousand years, what, it is, what happens? It comes out of the bottomless pit. So you can start piecing together what you're looking at. You seeing how we're collecting data? And, and, and you take your time. You don't assume. If you have not particularly read this one, don't guess. Don't start talking about what's the Antichrist. Don't start talking about what's this. Don't start talking about what's that based on your memory. See, this is the part why the scripture would have to tell us to study. Because most people don't know the time it takes the actual study. Hello? This is the thing I've been trying to say to you guys for the last couple of weeks. I don't want to do to you the unfair thing that most teachers do. I do not want to stand up and teach you something I learned five, ten years of course of time and make you think you're going to get it in two minutes, ten minutes, sitting at your kitchen table. Hello? A lot of people that teach Bible prophecy have studied Bible prophecy for years. Hello? 
And most of the people that I know when they get ready to teach Bible prophecy, it even though they studied it, some people 10, 20 years plus, it still take them six to eight months to even get ready to teach it. Because it's detailed. It's detailed. Scripture has to answer the question. Not your memory, not your knowledge. Comparing what? Spiritual things with what? Comparing scripture with, comparing what God said with what God said. Amen? Okay, a little further and then I'm coming to you. What does it say? Ooh, y'all pray in here. Amen? It's fine. It's just, you know, it's a lot of information. It ain't a bad spirit. It's just heavy. Like, ooh. Amen. All right. What is it? Let's read a little further. What did he say? The so beast, coming out of the bottomless pit uh -huh. and go into what? Perdition. Uh-huh. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder. Come on. Whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Uh-huh. When they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Okay. Now, what does he say? And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings. Uh -huh. Five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short pace. Look, are you space. saying this? So you. S See all these details? You would just keep gathering data. Don't assume you know what they mean. Don't assume because you saw kingdoms. Don't assume them the kings that's going to work with the Antichrist. What if you're looking at the kings that was in the great image? What if you're looking at the number of kings that have been throughout Israel's lineage? You don't know what you're looking at. You got to study to do what? Show yourself approved unto God. Keep reading. What does he say? And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth mm -hmm. and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. Mm -hmm. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. Come on. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. And what they're going to do? These shall make war with the lamb. There goes some detail now about these particular ones. They're going to make war with who? The lamb. Uh-huh. And the lamb shall overcome them. Come on. For he is Lord of lords mm -hmm. and king of kings. Mm -hmm. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Now watch this. What did he say? And he saith unto me, the waters which thou sawest where the horse sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Mm-hmm. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree, and give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city. She's what? That great city. Great city. So now what if I could research great city? What if, what if, what if I could find, what if I research that? Are y'all researching it? What does it say? You what? That's where you at, Amy. You said what? 17 times. Okay, what do you see it? Have you looked through to see if you find anything interesting in any of them?
Huh? Look at You guys know when you search, if you put the quotations around it, it'll search exactly that. If you don't put the quotations around it, it'll search everywhere that great is said and city, city is said, is which is going to be hundreds. But if you put it in quotations, great city, you, you, you'll get it exactly in that order. Well, let me tell you what I would do if I was you. Even, and, I, and that is a good thing, and I would do that to narrow, but let me tell you something. I would write it without the quotations and search in Revelations first. Since that's the, that's the book you're in. Because where do you always start in your search? Context and begin to go out from context. Hmm? Revelations 11 and 8, what does it say? And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Oh, that's a good one. That's a real good one. Amen. Where was your Savior crucified? Nobody gonna tell me? So what's the great city? All right. Now, if Jerusalem, is she called the harlot in scripture? Mm. So the things will start lining up if we keep compiling keywords. Hello? We could start narrowing down, does these things apply? No? Go to Revelation 16. And I'll start at 19 just for the sake of shortening. What does it say? And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Mm -hmm. and, sorry, and every island fled away. And the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. There are so many different places that you can just keep going throughout and finding detail, detail about this great city. Hello? And that was just one. We could have looked it up by Harlot and so many other things that are there. Yes? Go to Revelations 21 and I guess read 9 and 10. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, 
Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away to, in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the this holy... Is, go ahead. The holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. So this new Jerusalem, and this being also called great city. What is it? A, was there a type of this before this one? And what city was that? Hello? If it's called New Jerusalem, then there must have been an old one. <laughs> must have been an old one. Amen. <laughs> but are you seeing now how you would start navigating, then you would gather your things. And I want y'all to once again remember now, I cannot create the Holy Ghost. Do you understand? Because while you're studying, you're going to be fellow. So things you wouldn't even think to consider about the scripture, things you wouldn't even think to research, buzzwords that you wouldn't even think to look up if you're, you're studying with the Holy Spirit, what is he going to be doing? He's going to be unctioning you and making certain things stand out and causing you to consider, wait a minute, I think I heard that before. Come on. I, maybe, maybe I heard God saying some city played the harlot. Come on. Where do you see him calling a city a whore? Do you see? So see see how that lets you narrow things down? Hello? Amen. Are, are we learning? Now see, when we looked in that place in 17, Revelation 17, and it said the waters you saw were people. See, there's nowhere to go to look for that. It just told you. Hello? But now something that simple, where I saw people preaching and it say, and she emerged from a, a, and set upon the waters and all, you know, or something like that, uh, set above the waters. If you don't turn around and, and keep reading and find that, don't, that, well, that ain't actually water. Water was a symbol of people. Then guess what ministers have done? Tried to interpret without honoring context and then start trying to explain <laughs> you know, because see, they are uh, the imports and exports, son, daughter that's talking about people. Relax. You, you're thinking too deep. Amen. You got to respect the context. Amen. Yes, ma'am. So, going back to Daniel, where it talked about that week. Mm hmm. Had I read that, I would have thought it meant like a literal week. So how would I have dug to find out that the days equal a year or would have even known that to go looking for that? One of the thing, one of the thing that, um, One of the things you would have needed to do was, first of all, always remember this. When you are st reading the scripture, and this is another thing, and, and that's why the more I tell y'all, the more you're going to say you need fellowship, right? Is never assume the word that's on the page mean what it mean in your language. Huh? <laughs> you say what? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, you remember? <laughs> You know, um, never assume that word is, this, why do you think so many people say it? They get so upset. I remember talking to a minister that got so upset. He just refused to accept that in the day that the sons of God gathered in, in Job did not mean what he wanted it to mean. Because he wanted to stick to what that meant in English. He did not want to acknowledge that this was translated from this Hebrew word, which means this, right? 
So the first thing, that's one thing to consider, to find out. That's why it's good to use your Thompson chains. That's why it's good to use your Strong's Bible. If you have a Strong's Touch Bible, now that we in, are in the electronic day, I can just touch that word. And it would say seven, i.e. a week specifically of years. Seven, period of seven days of years. Now, so everything in the definition of the word for that term week means years. Now, let me see, because there's actually a scripture that speaks to it. So, type in the word week and the word year and see if something else comes up. Week and years. What, what comes up? Uh-huh. And what is it talking about? Read it. Fulfill her week, and we will give thee this also for the service which thou shalt serve with me yet seven other years. So there's one, right? There are several other. Now, let me tell you to answer your question more specific, because I want to do this question you asked me, Justice, because it, it's, it's the question that I told you. You would have never just jumped there. You would have never jumped, you would have never assumed you were anyone else that a week meant years. But if you had start studying the covenant, the covenant has always been for seven years. There, the reason why most people get lost is they forget that the covenant was seven years, but God has always testified that he would disannul it, that he's going to break it in the middle of the week, that he's going to shorten the time, some scripture says, except the time be shortened. You see, a, a lot of those things point to what would be the disannulling of that covenant. So you wouldn't have jumped there from Daniel 9. You would have started searching the covenant. And remember now, because you're specifically talking about a covenant that Israel made, it wouldn't be difficult to find it. What covenant that Israel is going to enter into that I would be able to call a covenant of death? And I think it's Ezekiel that God goes into great detail. I think it's Ezekiel. All right? Is it, I asked that during the conference. Was Ezekiel the one that he told him, go, down, go on the side of the, of the gate and start digging? He tells him to start digging in a hole in a wall. Do you all remember that? No. It was one of the prophets. I think it was Ezekiel. And he, d he went to digging. So watch this. It's Ezekiel. Go to Ezekiel 8.
Okay, go to Ezekiel 8 and 3. And he put forth the arm, the form of an hand, and took me by a lock of mine head. Mm-hmm. He had locks. Come oh, on, and read he, it. See, y'all way into details. And, See what I'm saying? Come on, read, daughter. <laughs> she don't, he got a heart. Praise you, Jesus. I, what? <laughs> and they was long enough to grab. Praise you, Jesus. Come on. Let's get <laughs> And he put forth the form of an hand and took me by a lock of mine head. Uh -huh. And the spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven. Come on. And brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem. He brought me in the visions of God. He brings me to Jerusalem. So he's in the spirit now. What does he say next? To the door of the inner gate that looketh toward the north. Okay, come on. Where was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provoketh to jealousy? Okay, so remember there's something that's going to provoke God. Mm -hmm. Okay, these are things that if you kept looking up, this abomination, desolation, it'll lead you there too. Okay, but now watch mm -hmm. this. Come on, what did he say? And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there, uh -huh. according to the vision that I saw in the plain. Come on. Then said he unto me, Son of man, lift up thine eyes now the way toward the north. Yes. So I lifted up mine eyes the way toward the north, and behold, northward at the gate of the altar, this image of jealousy in the entry. Come on. He said furthermore unto me, Son of man, seest thou what they do? Even the abominations that the house of Israel committed here. Even the what? Abominations. Even the what? Abominations. You reading what they say there? Oh, sorry. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. All right. Even the great abominations that the house of Israel committed here, uh -huh. that I should go far off from my sanctuary. Look at this now. This is supposed to be a place dedicated to me, but there's an abomination happening here that'll make me separate myself from it. What do he say next? But turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. And there's something greater happening than what you can see outside. What do he say? And he brought me to the door of the court. And when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. Come on. Then said he unto me, son of man, dig now in the wall. Come on. And when I had digged in the wall, behold, a door. Come on. And he said unto me, go in and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. This, see what they doing in this place they say for me. Keep reading. So I went in and saw. And behold, every form of creeping things and abominable beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. So hidden inside, they have their idols in a house that they're acting like it's for me. Israel has gone into idolatry. It's back now into the gods of the world. Okay, come on. And there stood before them 70 men of the ancients of the house of Israel. And in the midst of them stood Jazaniah, the son of Shaphan, with every man his censer in his hand. Mm -hmm. And a thick cloud of incense went up. Mm -hmm. Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Come on. Every man in the chambers of his imagery? Come on. For they say, The Lord seeth us not. The Lord hath forsaken the earth. Uh huh. He said also unto me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they, they do. They doing some worse than this? Okay, what happened? Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house. This is this is now he's taking them past what's happening in his city. He said, Now I want you to go what's I want you to see what's actually happening in my house. What'd he say? which was toward the north. Mm -hmm. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tamuz. Then said he unto me, Has thou seen this, O son of man? Uh -huh. Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations seen than these. Him to the courts of the house of God, so he can see what's happening here, what's going on among his people. See, I want you to see these are where you start filling in the details of why God got so angry Jesus. with them. What does he say? And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. And behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men, with their backs toward the temple of the Lord, and their faces toward the east. 
and they worshiped the sun toward the, oh, the wait, east. Wait a minute. And they did what? Worshiped the sun. Uh-huh. Then, then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Mm -hmm. Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger. Mm -hmm. And lo, they put the branch to their nose. Mm -hmm. Therefore will I also deal in fury. Mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity. Mm -hmm. And though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet will I not hear them. They're going to go against everything I ever taught them. They're going to do everything under the sun there is to do. And they get worse than this. One, one place they showed harlotry happening in the inner chambers. It was so much stuff going on. God say, they're going to be acting like this is my temple. Let me show you what they'll be doing in the secret parts of it. There's so much detail in there that I, like I told you, to be a whole lesson, because there's so. When you start talking about the 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 crust of the abomination of desolation, is to set up the image, where where something else is worshipped in God's house other than Him. But look at all the details. Look at all the other things that surround that that is easy to be missed. Do you see? So you, that's where you would find yourself studying this covenant. What covenant is Israel going to make? And you would bump into the seven, and you would then be able to start reconciling. You see? Because the scripture has to do what? First, in context. Then, in light of the mystery of God. And then, in light of how much? All scripture. So the, seven, the weak would never pass the test of all scripture. Because all of the scripture that speaks of this covenant that Israel will enter is all around seven years. Amen? So, this, so then you would then go and is where you would end up, which is where I took you. Is there any place in scripture that a week represents seven years? And then you could type week, years, and see the scripture that ties them together and say, aha, the scriptures do tie this together. And there's a such thing called a week of years. Amen? But do you see how naturally she would have bumped into that just studying out the covenant? See the difference? It's much different. The natural investigation feels much different than trying to cancel out something you think. Discovery is always easier than cancellation. Teaching gets so difficult because most of the time we're dealing with cancellation. You see what I mean? Like when I got ready to teach what the kingdom was, teaching what the kingdom is is easy. Teaching you what you thought the kingdom was ain't true is the hard part. <laughs> canceling out is always harder than discovery. It is easier to learn than to unlearn. <laughs> Amen. It is easier to learn than to unlearn. Because when you're learning the first time, there's nothing there to combat the information. When you unlearning, there is something already sitting in the spot of that truth that don't go. And so it's standing there saying, uh, -uh I go here. Uh, uh I go here. Amen. But when we're studying, amen, glory to God, amen, Sh uh, Chantel wrote, building is easier than tearing down, especially to rebuild. See, it's always, demolition is always an extra job. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Good question. Any other question? Y'all don't, come on. Y'all don't stop with your questions now. What happened to your question? We already went over it. Okay. Okay, come on. We open floor. Go ahead. Okay. I was going to um, ask the question in Revelation 17 and um, 11. I was um, I was reading Revelation um, 
and this part when we started talking about it's crazy that you went here because this is um actually what me and Danielle was talking about the other day as well but mm -hmm. the part that kind of got me was when it said and the beast that was and is not even he is the eighth and is of the seven and go off into perdition and the reason why it kind of um held me up is because the beast that she was sitting on had seven heads and so i was just trying to figure out where they got even he is the eighth and is of the seven from See, you asking me for another pig. It is a pig because what you're asking me to do is, it is not a blanket question of what is this scripture talking about? It is saying, based on what I think and what I've seen, make this make sense. And it's not a, I, and I keep trying to teach you y'all. Most of y'all questions are like that and it's okay. But it makes the question not clear cut. You understand? It makes it not clear cut because it's not just a rightly dividing the words question. It is a explain based on how I think question. You see the difference? It's not just a break down this scripture question. It is, okay. Based on this, based on something this woman was sitting on, make it go together. <laughs> you see the difference? Am I making sense to you? Y'all don't get it? Okay. Okay. It's, it's the thing I was teaching y'all about theory. You're not just asking me what 2 plus 2 means. You're asking me what 2 plus 2 relative to MC squared means. And I'm okay, but it, it takes longer to teach it because first of all, I got to now establish MC square. Then I have to establish two plus two and then I have to bridge the gap to bring them together. Completely different way. Seems normal when you're thinking it. <laughs> Do you see? And do you see how it's going to put us out here? Because you got four lessons in the study guide. What are the four lessons? Discerning the kingdom, appearing of the kingdom, doctrine of hope, power of hope, and steadfast and unmovable. And y'all talking to me about kings and beasts. See the difference? <laughs> See the difference? It doesn't matter if it's in there. It matters, is it being discussed? Is it a part of the discussion? Not a part of your curiosity. <laughs> you see the difference? <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So now go in the study guide and look at what's written there. What page are you? Because Daniel says it's in there. Where is it in there, Daniel? Help your brother out. Where is it in there? Page 30. Okay, let's go to page 30. <laughs> uh-huh, yeah, you did, but it's okay. Come on in. The water is warm. <laughs> <laughs> you in here now? Okay, where are you at? Page 30. What paragraph? Okay, John also bore witness to this. What did John bore witness to? Okay, let's go back up to 28. All right. Here we see that Satan will empower the Antichrist to deceive with signs and lying wonders. The seventh verse mentions the mystery of iniquity, warning us that this is already happening with Satan's ministers today. Nevertheless, we see that at the return of the Lord, he will destroy the Antichrist with the brightness of his coming. The saints must endure the fact that the Antichrist will prosper in evil until the end, which is the Lord's return knowing that Daniel said that he would make war with the saints and prevailed against them. 
John also bore witness to this. He prophesied that the Antichrist would blaspheme and use his united kingdoms to make war with the saints and prevail. However, he also confirmed that the Lord would afterwards war against the Antichrist and his armies and do what? So now we are going to Revelation 13 and Revelation 17 to establish that when Jesus wars with the Antichrist, he wins the battle. Now that's why we do. Reconcile the question. <laughs> it's okay. And I don't, once again, I'm saying to y'all again, curiosity is great, right? Questions are good. The curiosity is great. There's nothing wrong with it. However, lean in. That's not the part we study in. And I want you to remember, I want y'all to learn something. The moment we start doing math, all math is relative to math, but it may not be relative to addition. You see, you, you all out in quantum physics, and we just trying to learn two plus two. You understand what I'm saying? Nothing wrong, but once you know it leads there, your curiosity is always going to jump. But to build you, and I want you to remember this, and because I'm, 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 I want y'all to stay curious and stay wondering, but accept the journey. Accept the journey. Accept that I, I'm letting you know. If you can't understand what I'm talking about on this paper, forget what you're curious about. <laughs> do, do you come? No, come on. You do you understand what I'm saying to you? Because what you're do? <laughs> no, come on. Because you're asking me to teach you quantum physics. When you are short, when you don't, you ain't swallowed addition and multiplication yet. It, you need this for us to even have this discussion over here. Your curiosity is full of these to get to this big bang. You know? Am I making sense? Amen. Glory to God. I think the first night we started doing this study, you mentioned, um, well, I think Pastor Brenda raised the question of when we start studying, then we kind of go down these different rabbit holes or whatever, and you mentioned jotting them Jot down, it. but stay on the course. Stay on the course. So what do you do with the jotted information? At what point do you come back to the jotted information? I always remember this, and this is the part I, I, I always say. There are so many questions I have before the Lord like that. I still have them today. I still, I don't know every single thing about the scripture. Here's the thing that I don't do. I never set the lesson plan for my teacher. God is not my curiosity, not my wonder, God. So this is what I do. Me and God got to understand about this pad that you better get by yours. He know I want to know this stuff from John, but I trust him when to teach it to me. I trust him when to teach it to me. And it makes learning so much simple. You know why? Because I'm always in the area he ready to illuminate. Do you see? I'm always where he's already talking. God is kind of stubborn. It's hard to get him to move the subject from what he know you need to know to what you're curious to know. You see? So I always take the low seat in my fellowship. Even in studying, I do not assume I know what I need to know. So I write down what caught my attention, right? And that's for a later discussion between me and him. Because I'm telling y'all, out of all the stuff I said, I done preached up and down throughout scripture, done preached the mysteries backwards and forwards, and I still didn't understand. But what qualifies you to even select me? I understand love, but you so love the world. What? I didn't understand that. That baffled me. And I don't think I'm the first one to be baffled. 
I think Paul was baffled before. Paul said, I'm trying to apprehend that by which I was apprehended. That don't make no sense there. Amen. Sound like that brother confused. <laughs> Sound like that brother said, I'm trying to comprehend what chose me, why it chose me, so I can understand it like it understand me. Amen. You're learning? So that's what I mean. So that's what you do with that, with those things. With those, uh-huh. Hallelujah. But that's what you do. That's all. You just, you put it there and put it before the Lord, but trust him. Trust him. If it's time, he's going to answer. But sometimes, remember, you got to see how the Holy Spirit teaches. Remember he told, um, there were things Jesus taught the, fair, I mean, taught the disciples. And there were things he didn't tell them right then. And he said, I got many things to say to you, but you can't bear them now. You need the Holy Spirit. And then when he, he didn't tell you, and when the Holy Spirit get here, he's just going to tell it all to you at one time. He said he's going to lead and you into all. So that's what you got to now train yourself to do. Allow him to do what? Because you got to even let him establish the question. You don't know what to ask him. You'll be asking God a question based on what you think somebody else knows. Well, it look like they understand it and, <laughs> and they may not even understand what you assume they understand. Because if you don't understand it, you don't know whether they do or not. Amen. <laughs> Amen. It's been some people that I thought teach so profoundly, and I found out, ooh, that's error. <laughs> Later, when the Holy Spirit taught me a simple truth, like, oh, my Lord, that's error. Amen. I remember trying to tell ministers the simplicity of take no thought for your life. What you going to eat or what you going to drink. Come on. And, and prophets are study giving out shopping lists. They're they going to give them out for this storm coming. Holy Spirit say stock up on gas. <laughs> Holy Spirit say buy candles. Holy Spirit, they're they going to keep giving out shopping lists. Come on, <laughs> they're going to they give them every New Year's and every, every doomsday prediction, glory to God, amen. They come out with a whole nother shopping list. I would listen to people during the pandemic, stock up on gas. I say some of these people stay in apartments, they can't do that. Them gas fumes, <laughs> you ain't going to have to worry about COVID. You leaving here by fumigation. <laughs> you over there in a studio apartment with gas stocked up. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. COVID is the least of your worries. <laughs> Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Yes, somebody wrote, God informs us on a need-to-know basis. He knows when you're ready. He knows when you're ready for that. He knows when, he knows what I'm ready to understand. And I'm curious about a lot. That's why I told you, don't, don't ever fault yourself for having the question. But I'm trying to tell you, it's harder when you're trying to forge your way into knowledge versus when you're invited into it. That's why the way I'm teaching you is to take the air out of knowledge. You understand? See, when people teach you in a way that says, yes, because I have knowledge of the word of the Lord. See, that, that creates status, classism, and it makes you want it for that. And then that's not, that's not the pureness of 
God has highlighted the need for me to comprehend this. You see the, you see the difference? I, I'm letting y'all know all these years later, I don't study competitively. Everything is fellowship to me. Everything is what do you desire to say to me? Everything is what do you desire for me to know? Now, over years of him teaching you, you're going to retain a lot. And you will end up being a well of knowledge of things that God has said and taught you down through the scriptures to be able to share that to strengthen other people's walk with God. But don't allow church and religion to put you into the rat wheel of chasing knowledge. Man, fellowship will automatically birth knowledge. I, and I don't, and I, I keep saying it over and over again, I only know fellowship-based study of scripture. I don't know nothing else. Am I making sense? So I can show you some of the tools I learned while I was fellowshipping with God, and they do help you navigate the scriptures. But I never got revelation from that. I received revelation from fellowship, and then I measured the revelation with the tools. Am I making sense? So God will say something to me, and I say, oh, my Lord. And when he says something to me, anybody in here ever got a revelation from God? Whenever God speaks, it highlights all the scriptures in you that pertain to that saying. So it creates a study base. Now you got a few scriptures to look up. Now you know where you're starting. You see what I'm saying? So that's, that's all I know. Because I didn't start off with knowledge. I started off with God. And then from fellowship with God, knowledge was acquired along the way. Am I making sense to you? Amen. So if you're asking me, Sometimes if you're asking me a question of a study like you would do a subject at school where you can just start from scratch, sometimes that's difficult for me to answer because I don't never really start that way. <laughs> Amen. I'm pretty sure it's probably some ways, but I want y'all to also remember without fellowship, we're blind to scriptures. The veil is there and all those. You understand what I mean? And, I, I, and it's certain things that God said to me that once again, like, I'm just not the one to ask <laughs> in that case. You understand what I mean by that? Let me show, like, do you remember when I showed y'all the scripture that said the love of God is shared abroad in our hearts? For years, I thought that meant inside. The love of God went in our heart and just was shared abroad inside our heart because it says shared abroad in our heart. That's what I thought. It's in my heart, abroad in my heart. That's how I thought. Until one day the Holy Spirit just spoke to me. He said to me, it is shared abroad in the world. Being spread to the world through your heart, son. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm the living word. Because men can't understand the scriptures you have made me an expression of what you are saying to them in the scriptures. So interaction with me is supposed to say, I love you. That's how I study. You, you get what I'm saying? So it's fellowship based. And if you are just sitting there with your curiosity and no fellowship, like, ooh, I wonder what that part right there means. You see what I'm saying? There's nothing wrong with it. But I, I'm just, I don't feel that qualified to answer because I don't, I've never followed that kind of trail. Am I making sense? Even when I'm ignorant, even when there is something like that that I'm sharing with you that I, I saw something I didn't understand, I don't say, oh yeah, ooh, I'm finna study that out. I say, Lord, what's that? What, do you see, I start talking to God, and God starts talking back to me, and then that fellowship is what's guiding me in my study. Or God will say, it's time for you to understand this. Like when he said to me, um, like when using something I, was, I, I mentioned tonight, I never went and studied um, 
When Remember I told y'all um, it is given unto you to know the mission of the kingdom of God? I never studied the scripture. I said, mm. it wasn't never settled. But I, I, I didn't go on no, let me see exactly what this mean and put this in context. It never even crossed my mind to do it. One day I was sitting at my office desk and the Holy Spirit, we were preparing for a conference and, or, or, or writing a textbook or something, and the Holy Spirit said to me, it is time for you to understand the elect. Okay. My elect. And so he started teaching me the elect. And when he started teaching me the elect, he included that scripture. I said, hold on. Now, this scripture was told that, to me that it meant this, this, that, and the other. He never answered. He finished the lesson. By the time he finished the lesson, I had the answer. Amen. When y'all went to, in the conference, when I taught that morning, and I went into Isaiah and Romans and, and, and put, coupled it with what was said in Matthew and what David said and what Isaiah said, by the time I got finished, then you know the answer? It is given to you? meaning you were a part of the elect, the remnant in this generation to know? Didn't that make sense? Okay, so that's what happened, but I never studied the subject. So most of my studies are like that. So that's what I'm, I'm looking at. When you guys are going down, like when you're reading in the study guide, allow the Holy Spirit to stay in charge. Your study is supposed to be led by him. Let him stay in charge. Let him say, I want you to comprehend this part. And he may open a whole door. And if he does, then when you get ready to discuss it, it'll come with that. The Holy Spirit spoke this to me about this particular passage, and he said, thus and so and thus and so. Can you provide more detail? You see, the question will be more pointed. It'll be more direction. It'll provide a clear path. If it, you, Am I making sense? Because... The revelation is one. The mystery of Christ is one. The moment you open the door to Christ, it opens the door to the whole mystery of God, right? And so all, just like math, all things are relative. The moment we're talking the numerical system, all things pertaining to the numerical system are relative, all the way to infinity. <laughs> Do you see? Amen. The simplicity of the number scale. Zero to nine. Always starting over. That goes all the way into infinity. Am I making sense? So the moment you teach me zero to nine, you have opened the door to all things relative to the numerical system. Same way so with the mystery of Christ. The moment you tell me Jesus saves, you have opened the door to all. Save from what? Save into what? Save why? For what purpose? See, it opens the door to it all. But, there's a, but when you're talking about studying, if what you want is what you seem, then I'm sharing with you how we get there. Because I would not know to put some of the scriptures together I put together without that. Am I making sense? Sometimes he'll just quote a scripture. I'll be sitting there like, what that part right there mean? He'll just quote another scripture. He'll just, he'll speak the keyword. Sometimes I just type in what I heard him say and go see scriptures I ain't never knew was in the Bible. I just be like, oh my God, I can't believe this one was right. You know? Like when the... I, I would have never in my right mind thought about the Lord humbles himself to behold the things that are in heaven. I could have read this Bible for a hundred years and would have never considered that passage. I would have never. You, you, am I making sense? And so what I don't want you to do, and I'm saying this to you not for you to feel discouraged about curiosity. I want you to know what to do with it. Because I don't want you to get discouraged going down rabbit trails that you may never find an end to. Because that may not be the part the Father have chosen to talk directly to you about. See, God is in control. He is 
the master of our entire journey. Amen. So when you're going into study, let him be the master of that too. I can teach you the particulars to rightly divide the word, but some ministers won't tell you the truth that the only way you're going to get them two scriptures together is by a revelation. They don't, you wouldn't, some of the ones we got together would never come together without a revelation. Ask the Pharisees. Amen. When Jesus was standing before them and saying, this is that and other, then they took, the, they took all the servants and killed them all. And then last he sent his son. And what would he say? Uh, yeah, he's going to utterly destroy him. He said, is, is it not written? What is he doing? He's connecting dots by a revelation of scripture. The scriptures are not coming together because he just walked through them. Am I making sense to you? Amen. It, see, whenever you start talking about that part where you're weaving the scriptures together, context is a little easier. But weaving the scriptures together, always remember it's like a jigsaw puzzle. Anybody ever work jigsaw puzzles? Auntie Pat got me doing them on the phone. You know what I have to do when I don't know what to do with a piece? What do I do? What do you do when you're doing a puzzle? You sit to the side. When you don't know what that piece is for, what you do? You look at the picture. See where the hair that thick on the dog is. See what, do you see? Same way with scripture. The revelation is like the finished picture. Once you have that, putting the pieces together is easier now. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so I don't want to cheat you out of the fact that I'm sometimes working with a finished picture first. And that's how them scriptures came together because with this in mind, that go with that, that go with that. That's in light of the revelation of Christ. You see it? That's that second step. Am I making sense? Now what I'm showing you, third step, is in light of how many scriptures. Which means now you can highlight a thing and see what all the scriptures say about this particular subject. That's how you search in light of all scripture. But that ain't how you search according to the revelation of the mystery of Christ. So when, when I'm asked questions of like timeline questions, most people who really have timeline accurate don't know it by study first. They know it by revelation. Do you understand what I'm saying? And then from revelation, you can start plugging the other pieces. in. If you start studying from that point, like, let me ask a question. Can I ask a question before we go? And then I'm going to take one or two more questions. And then we, we, we're going out. Let me ask a question. What is the appearing of the kingdom? If you had to explain the appearing of the kingdom in a few words to me, without looking in your paper, we'll close it. Because you're not going to walk around with that. If you had to tell me what the appearing of the kingdom is, what would that be? To me, oh. oh. Don't tell me to me. I, tell me what it means. Because it has to mean the same thing to all people. The manifestation <laughs> of the kingdom on the earth. The manifestation of the kingdom on earth. So if I was somebody who didn't know anything, you would walk up to me and say, the appearing of the kingdom is the manifestation of the kingdom on earth. I would be very confused. It's true, though. What you said is true. Again, if I didn't know a thing and you were going to teach me the appearing of the kingdom in a few words, what would you say to me? Any other takers? See, I love stuff like this because it challenges you now to evangelize. You got to think like you're not talking to somebody who in the class with you. That's what's going to make you thorough. 
You raise your hand. Go ahead. The appearing of the kingdom I w um, is when Christ returns. Who is that? Who is Christ? Oh, I'm a person, remember? See, remember what I said. If I'm a person that don't know nothing. Yeah, you know, crazy. How would okay. you, you know, uh, don't know. Okay. There's so many gods. There are many gods. There are, men, there are many gods that there men are? make, but there is only one God. Oh, okay. Well, see, that yeah. might be where you want to start introducing yeah. me at, right there. Okay, go ahead. I got to start I'm by listening. explaining God. Okay, huh? so God. Okay, so start at God, not the appearing of the kingdom. Start at who God is. If I needed, I don't know, I'm not telling you where to start. I'm just okay. telling you, explain the appearing okay. of the kingdom to somebody who knows nothing about it. Okay, all right. Um, so right now, although it does not appear to be, this world is actually ran by another spirit. It does not look like that right now, but there's something called the appearing of the kingdom. And that is when Christ, who is the son of God, that is when Christ will return to the earth because he once was here. He was born here in the earth. His mother's Mary and he was born. <laughs> <laughs> like, you don't know nothing so <laughs> when I say return I want you to know he was here before you gonna really confuse me <laughs> it's okay though <laughs> let me that. no let me tell you not that was a really good though I really want to say that was good much that was that y'all coming along now listen I'm ask, I'm asking this question for a reason mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm asking this question because I want you to consider what you haven't considered I want you to think about if you ain't, you don't have nothing but a few minutes. Now, if I'm a Gentile, Most men. which is going to be the majority of the people you possibly minister to, where did I point you to tell you a good example of how to start? Who? And where was he? In Athens. Paul was in Athens. Remember? The people who, he said, I went through your little town and I saw your little place of worship and you had a lot of altars set up and there was one that had an inscription upon it to the unknown God, to him will I declare. And then in a few sentences, he introduces them to the kingdom of God. In less than a chapter. It's a good thing to study for that question. There is a God who created the earth, the heavens, and the things that are in it, including you. That God has been very patient because he knows that man has been ignorant of him. However, that God has revealed his son, whose name is Christ, who he sent to the earth to redeem us from the bondage that we were placed in in the beginning of creation. He has come to reveal God to us and to show us the way to God. Yes, that same Jesus, glory to God, and according to the knowledge he has given us, God is demanding that everyone repent, turn from the way they think and come into what he taught. That Jesus, God chose to rule the works of his hands. The heavens, the earth, and the things that are in them. He's coming back to rule all creation from this planet. When he returns, that is the appearing of the kingdom. 
That is not what you said. <laughs> HD, you did not supply that. <laughs> We say that's what you meant, though, ain't it? Amen. <laughs> Go ahead. I want to say I enjoyed this because this happened to me. Uh huh. Uh, I have like a um, uh, I call her my co-teacher, but I work with her, and she says she's not saved, and she into like that natural stuff and all that. Mm -hmm. So I was um, but I know the Lord has us there for a purpose. So I was sitting, I was reading my Bible on my phone as my parents was picking up their kids, and she's talking about them a lot of words on that phone. <laughs> and so um, I was like, yeah, she said, what you doing? I said, I'm reading the Bible. She's talking about what you, what you read? And so I was like, well, I'm reading about the kingdom. And she asked me, she was like, well, what are you talking about? You know, what you read? I might know. I want to know. And but when I started explaining to her, she tuned out, like, because it wasn't um, palatable. Like, it wasn't broken down, like. You like it needed you to be. You start I, talking like she went Like to she know. And exactly. I could see her face and she they just kind of tuned out. So I'm, Lord, give me a redo. I'm just asking God for a redo. <laughs> Amen. Ain't nothing wrong with it. He can set the stage for it. That's why 